Welcome to this edition of Security and Compliance Weekly. On our show today, we're going to take up the topic of the lack of diversity in our industry, both on the security and the compliance side, particularly with regard to the experiences of African Americans. To facilitate our discussion today, we're very pleased to welcome AJ Yon. AJ is a founding member of the I'm only going to say this once. National Association of Black Compliance and Risk Management Professionals, or NABCRIMP for short. We'll spend the first segment uh, getting to know AJ and framing some of the problems associated with the lack of diversity in our industry. And we'll continue the discussion in our second segment and hopefully talk about uh, some solutions to the problems and, and ways that all of us can make a difference. So our focus is a little different in terms of the silos and bridges today, but join us as we continue the tearing down and building on Security and Compliance Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. And now, it's the show that bridges the requirements of regulations, compliance, and privacy with those of security. Your trusted source for complying with various mandates, building effective programs, and current compliance news. It's time for Security and Compliance Weekly. Cyber risk and compliance automation is finally here. Legacy GRC systems cannot simplify the complex use cases and deliver powerful automation that cyber teams need. CyberSaint's integrated risk management solution ingests data from your existing tech stack, dynamically lighting up controls using patented AI. Leverage your expertise and showcase business value. Let your risk and compliance solution work for you. See why the most forward-thinking CISOs of the Fortune 500 support their teams with CyberSaint. Maximize your cybersecurity program today. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash CyberSaint SCW. The average cost to respond to an insider threat is $11.45 million. That's a lot of reasons why a functional insider threat program must be a core part of any modern cybersecurity strategy. To protect your organization's sensitive data and meet compliance requirements, you need controls in place to deter, detect, and disrupt insider threats. With ECRAN system, you can meet control requirements imposed by compliance mandates all within one insider threat management platform. Get your free 30-day trial at securityweekly.com forward slash ECRAN. That's E-K-R-A-N, and fulfill your compliance requirements. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome to episode 54 of Security and Compliance Weekly. We are recording live on December 1st, 2020. I'm your host, Mr. Jeff Mann, and joining me today virtually, of course, are my co-hosts Scott Lyons and Josh Marpet. And as a special treat today, we're joined by a new co-host, uh, Mr. Frederick Lee, or as most people know him, Flea. Welcome, gentlemen. Good morning. Always Episode a pleasure. 54. What's that, Scott? I said episode 54, man. We're, we're, look, look, we're already we're, we're already off and running with this. Wow. We're, we're cranking them out in PCI, just for the record, PCI. Get the count going. Although I'm not sure it'll come up there very much today. Hey, before we jump into it, I do have a few announcements. Do you always end up missing our live streams or the conversation that goes along with it on the Discord server? Need somewhere to flag Security Weekly podcasts that you want to listen to? Subscribe on your favorite podcast catcher or our YouTube channel. Also, sign up for our mailing list and join the Discord server to stay in the loop on all things Security Weekly. You can do all this by going to securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. Also, Security Weekly, in partnership with Cyber Risk Alliance, is excited to present Security Weekly Unlocked, which will be a little over a week from now, December 10th, 2020. This one-day virtual event wraps up with the 15th anniversary edition of Paul Security Weekly live on YouTube. Start your journey with going by going to securityweekly.com forward slash unlocked 
to view the agenda and register. And by the way, it is free. All right. We have a lot of ground to cover today. But first, uh, let me give a, a quick introduction to our new co-host, uh, Flea, Frederick Lee. Fred? Flea? Did anybody ever call you Fred? I just did. Sorry. Uh, uh, welcome. Actually, welcome. Yeah, the only person that calls me Fred and get away with it is my dad. So Flea or Frederick, <laughs> Flea is what most people call me. So. Yeah. If you're like most people, it's Frederick when you're in trouble. And that's with yeah. your mom. Yeah. <laughs> and whatever your middle name is. Uh, oh, dear God. Get... If you hear your middle name, you're in trouble, man. <laughs> Run we'll, the uh, we're, we are planning on starting to, you know, for our listening audience, we're planning on starting to rotate, rotate in uh, some other co-hosts because we, we've we've talked to some incredible, incredible people this year and we wanted to invite them back. Uh, Flea was on security, Paul Security Weekly this summer. I think it was back in late August or September, episode six. 55 i think it was or 665 one of the two uh i'm sure johnny will find the link and drop it in the uh, discord channel so if you want to get to know flea a little bit go check out his interview and in coming episodes we'll we'll spend a little time little time it is 665 i thought i had typed it thank you johnny uh so let's turn our attentions now to our guest today mr aj yawn aj welcome to security and compliance weekly Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Uh, really, really honored to be here and, and chat with you about important topic uh, at, at a really important time. So great to be here with all of you. Well, we like to start all our interviews with getting a, a chance to know our guests a little bit. So could you briefly just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and, and, and in particular, how you ended up where you are today? And feel free to, to mention uh, your, your new business venture. Uh, I, I would love to, again, have you back to talk about that more at length, but uh, we'll just gloss over it briefly today. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, name is AJ Yan. When I'm in trouble, my mom yells Alexander Joshua. Uh, that's my full name that mm -hmm. gets yelled at me when I get in trouble. Uh, <laughs> and I started my cybersecurity career in the U.S. Army, uh, similar to a lot of veterans that I think are in the, or a lot of folks in cybersecurity that are vets. Uh, I started out as a U.S. Army officer, uh, where I served for about six years in the Army, both here stateside and deployed. Uh, where I worked as a information security officer. And, and I, I say kind of like an information security officer because I had a boss that told me if uh, my battalion commander, if it plugged in, it was my responsibility. So I would fix his lights, I would fix his computers, I would fix the network, um, I would fix whatever he yelled at me to fix. Um, but I did learn a lot about leadership and uh, when I left the military, I went to a cybersecurity consulting firm where I focused on compliance assessments, beginning with SOC 2, uh, where I, I, I really carved out my, my career, perform, helping perform SOC 2 examinations, helped grow this consulting firm from about nine folks to well over 130. And we expanded from SOC 2 to ISO, HIPAA, high trust, et cetera. And my role was really around cloud security helping uh, companies establish new cloud environments uh, that are also, they're gonna be secure and compliant uh, and making sure that they're making those, uh, those right architectural decisions that are gonna help them meet those frameworks. And while I was there, I learned uh, that uh, the compliance process can suck. Uh, so we launched Byte Check recently to make compliance suck less. And it's a, 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 software, um, a software company where we are helping automate the compliance process by focusing on technology, focusing on security, and getting evidence directly from those tools out there where, where that information lives. So a um, little bit about me, you know, that's, that's my background. Started in the Army. Uh, my education background is Florida State, which is uh, how Jeff and I uh, started our, our relationship talking about basketball because um, I played basketball mm -hmm. at Florida State for a little bit. Uh, and I also have a master's uh, from Georgetown University. So, yeah, I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time reminiscing about ACC basketball because I'm a, I'm a lifelong uh, resident in uh, of Maryland and therefore a Terps fan and uh, I did I did certainly enjoy the stroll down memory lane back when the Terps were part of the ACC but another topic for another day um, we like to uh, ask our our guests a qualifying question that's that's we call the hot seat question and it's just to give us an, a, a little bit of an idea where you're where you're coming from 
uh, in terms of this thing that we call security versus compliance that everybody you, you already touched on it a little bit in your in your brief biographical uh, sketch there but uh, let me ask the question simply where do you fall AJ on what we like to call the security versus compliance continuum uh, I don't think they're opposing forces. I think uh, we see that people say uh, compliance is not security. And I get it. Um, you can meet a compliance framework and not be secure. However, security is compliance. And if we peel back all of these frameworks, we peel back SOC 2, PCI, whatever it is, uh, I, I, there's a PCI for you. I know Jeff didn't say it, but uh, if we peel back <laughs> all of these frameworks, it's the same thing. Um, we're all talking about privileged users. We're talking about vulnerability scans. We're talking about making sure that your boundaries protected. It's all the same basic security concepts. So if, in the, if organizations focus on security, the result's going to be compliance. They're going to be able to achieve whatever compliance goals. The problem comes into play where we get security and compliance being opposing forces is where organizations are not getting that security value out of these assessments. They're only getting a check the box. They're only going through an assessment just to get through the assessment. They're not actually becoming more secure. And one example I always like to give that I understand why organizations uh, or this security versus compliance happens. If you look at, if you pick up a SOC 2 report for an organization that's hosted on AWS, the chances of finding a control related to S3 bucket security is very rare. Um, and if all of us that are in the security space, we understand on AWS, one of the biggest risk and threats is S3 buckets um, and, and open S3 buckets. That's where a lot of breaches, we can just, you can just Google it and see the many different breaches that exist out there. But organizations are paying $50,000, $60,000 for SOC 2s, and they're not even getting the biggest threat uh, in their environment looked at. And that's why people, there's this opposing idea of security versus compliance, in my opinion, because there's no security value coming out of these assessments. But I think if we focus more on security and less on this alphabet soup of frameworks, you'll see that organizations will see that security actually should be and is compliance um, instead of being this, this, this opposing force. Wow. We really want to have you back to dig into this because you, you're, you're you're poking the bear in so many ways with some of the things you said in, in, a, good, in a good way. But uh, I do want to to, to shift focus t to uh, uh, our topic on hand today, which we wanted to talk about diversity. You're a, a founding board member of. Uh, don't make me Not say perfect. it again. Nab crimp. Uh, let's start there. Tell us, you know, tell us why you started this organization, in particular, why the focus on compliance professionals, if not security professionals. Uh, you know, let's let's kick it off from there. Yeah. Um, so I, I came across Nab crimp uh, uh, just randomly, I think, on LinkedIn, and I was able to connect with the the, the original founder, named Jennifer Newton, also a Florida State grad. Uh, and to chat with her about the organization and what they were building. And, and I just, you know, kind of begged her to get involved uh, because like many other people that I've talked to about NAB crimp, when I first saw it, I thought uh, it was a joke. I, I was like, wait, there's an, there's an organization dedicated to black compliance and risk management professionals. This, this has to be a mm -hmm. joke because one, you don't see a lot of black compliance and risk management professionals. Uh, and, and secondly, I, I, I didn't think an organization like that would, would exist or even be carved out for compliance and risk. And uh, I, in the cybersecurity space, am extremely passionate about getting people into cybersecurity period, especially people that look like me. And I think that the governance, compliance and risk management area is one of the ways that you can get into cybersecurity in a a uh, quicker manner than say uh, another area where most people that are trying to get into cybersecurity, the first thing they say they want to do is pen is learn how to pen test. Oh, oh I'm, I'm going to be a pen tester. And it's like, <laughs> everybody doesn't need to be a pen tester. Um, you can go into and, and come into this governance role that has a little bit less of a technical learning curve to, to get in uh, and, and do really well. Um, so when I, when I found out about the organization and the mission of just promoting the professional development of, of African-Americans in the compliance and risk management space, I, I just had to get involved. I was fortunate enough to be elected to as one of the founding board members. Uh, the, the really cool part about it is it's not just about what we're talking about here, security and compliance. It's 
all different levels of compliance. I'm actually the only founding board member that's in the cybersecurity space. So I'm really the only represented representative of the technical aspect of compliance and risk. Everybody else comes from financial backgrounds or HR or legal. Um, we have a few lawyers, uh, a few folks that deal with um, international international compliance regulations. So the, the cool thing that I've seen in this organization is how wide compliance and risk is, um, which means there's a huge opportunity for uh, African Americans in this country to get into this field because our whole model, everything that we're creating is about representation. It's about making sure that people see other people that look like them doing well in this field and understand that they can reach out and talk to us. They can reach out and, and go to our events and speak to us about what it takes to do well in this field. So the organization's sole goal, you know, is to promote the professional development of African-Americans into compliance and risk management through uh, education sessions, uh, you know, networking, mentorship, all kinds of different things that you would expect from a professional organization. But I think the unique thing about it and the reason why we've been able to have some initial early traction as a nonprofit is because this does didn't exist. Uh, there wasn't an organization out there for Black compliance and risk management professionals to grow and to be, uh, you know, educated about coming into this field um, and getting into this field and, and what what the benefits are. So um, it was, you know, by chance that I came across it, but I I immediately was like, I have to figure out a way to get involved. Um, whatever way that was, whether that's a founding board member or just a volunteer, I really just wanted to be involved in getting more people into this field uh, because I think it's a it's a great field to be in. And from a security perspective, everybody needs to know compliance. I don't care if you're an engineer. I don't care if you're a, secure, a system administrator. You need to understand compliance because all of your architecture decisions, all of your development decisions are going to be impacted by whatever compliance regulations uh, your organization is beholden to. So I think it's important that everybody has these skills, period, whether regardless of what part of security you're in, but it's really a great field to get started in in this industry. Hey, AJ, I was reading up a little bit more on the organization and I saw that one of the things that, you know, you mentioned that the mission of the organization is, is to bring more people in and, and to kind of like work on some of the pipeline issues. I'm kind of curious, how do you get, you know, young African-Americans interested in compliance specifically when obviously there's a lot more kind of like, you know, fame and I guess kudos for somebody who wants to be a pen tester, kind of as you mentioned, or somebody who thinks that, you know, quote unquote, being a hacker or the, um, you know, I, I guess the the miss the myth of you know cybersecurity just being more technical than compliance. And I'm kind of curious, like, how do you get people inspired to do compliance as opposed to some of the other things that may be competing with it? Yeah, that's a great question, and it, and I think it just is about being vocal and going to where these people are. Uh, you know, you I I feel like I now have a personal responsibility to be myself. Uh, consistently, whether that's on LinkedIn, whether that's on any other social networks, whether that's just in speaking engagements, for me to be the 31-year-old, am I 31? No, I'm 32 now. Wow, I'm old. 32-year-old uh, Black dude uh, that's in cybersecurity and compliance, because I think the reason why everybody runs to the pen tester or runs to that route is because that's, like you said, it's what, it's what's famous. It's what people know. Um, and they never seen anyone that is a normal person in compliance. I remember back in 2017, I did an audit and uh, the client said, I thought you were gonna be Toby from the office. And I think that's what everybody thinks about when they think about compliance is <laughs> just like these, this stuck up middle, mid-age white dude in the over, oversized suit. Um, but I think if more people understand hey, hey. that, Hey, regular tailored, folks okay? <laughs> that look like us um, <laughs> in this field, they're, they're going to want to do it. They're going to want to be interested in it. So, Flea, I think it's about being vocal. It's about communicating what we do, uh, why we do it, and why it's important. That's the thing that I found in compliance is purpose. Um, you find in, in all cybersecurity, you get a lot of purpose because you're doing something really important. But in compliance, you start to see the impacts from a security perspective, but also a business perspective of the organizations are able to grow their businesses because of compliance assessments. So I think it's it's educating them what does compliance mean in cybersecurity um, and then showing them that you can be normal. You can be a normal person. You can still be cool, quote unquote, cool uh, in, in compliance. Um, and then lastly, it's going to where they're at. I think the problem with this quote unquote pipeline problem 
is that we're just not looking in the right places. We're looking in all of the same places for the same types of candidates from the same schools with the same degrees, and, and we're not expanding uh, out to where we're looking for. So one of the things that we want to do, obviously, once things uh, pick back up or, or get back to whatever normal looks like, is hmm. we're going to live at HBCUs. Uh, we're going to consistently be at HBCUs and not just in the MIS programs. Uh, the beauty of governance and compliance is that you can come from other fields and do really well here. Uh, you can do really well in the compliance space from other fields. So we're going to make sure we're going out and finding that social science or that arts major or whoever and, and educate them about what we're doing um, and, and making sure that they understand that this is another path, um, which is really the goal is like, I just want people to know that this is a route, a route into the field and, and a route into very a successful field is through compliance. And the more people I think that are aware about that um, will we'll, we'll start to join. But it's, it's definitely going to take time. Can I, uh, I want to throw one <laughs> thing uh, uh, at you, uh, it's sort on, of a question on. and a comment. And the comment is, by the way, about your, your point about uh, other fields, not just MIS, way awesome. Uh, one of our top compliance people actually came out of criminal justice. But because she knows how to parse law and regulation, it compliance became very naturally to her. She's like, oh, I can understand this. I read the compliance standard. I can parse all the pieces of it and I can answer those questions. And it was it was awesome. Yeah. And she knows how to write. Oh, my God, what an advantage over most uh, uh, security people. Uh, the one thing I want to sort of ask is that there's a lot of colleges that have large African-American populations that are not the HBCUs. Uh, uh, so I, 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 I'm not disputing you. I just sort of want to expand that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, there's a there's a huge debate within the the black community in itself between uh, HBCUs and a school that I went to, like Florida State, is considered a PWI or predominantly white institution. Uh, and I know when I was at Florida State, so in Tallahassee, um, a, a great place, by the way, uh, definitely to go to school. <laughs> uh, we were right next to FAMU, which is an HBCU, yeah. one of the uh, the oldest and largest HBCUs in the country. So we would uh, constantly frequent FAMU, for for lack of a better word, um, to to <laughs> to partake in the activities over there. But there was always this uh, feeling of the black people at Florida State were left out um, or or didn't not necessarily left out, but were just different, looked different, acted different than the ones at at FAMU. So it's a it's a fair question and a fair point that I think we need to make sure that we are expanding uh, our resources to the PWIs out there. However, the reason why at least this is this is this is AJ, this isn't NAB crimp. Um, this is the reason why I am so big on focusing on HBCUs is is for two reasons. I think we need to get more people into HBCUs. I'm I'm originally from California. Uh, and I didn't know anything about HBCUs growing up. Um, there's no HBCUs out on the West Coast, and I didn't know anything about them, and I didn't really understand the benefit of going to an HBCU. And I think with professional organizations and companies getting more involved at the HBCUs, it helps grow the grow those company grow those universities. Whereas Florida State. There's enough resources there. Our career center is doing well. Our the professional organizations involved at Florida State are 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 going to help individuals leave that university because of the people that went there, because of the many people that went to these big schools that are already out in companies. Where we need to get more people from HBCUs into these companies so they can start to build those pipelines of reaching back to their alma maters. Um, so I'm thinking, so, okay. you know, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is like the next three years is a sole focus on trying to grow HBCUs. I have a theory about how to do that through sports, which we can get to on another day. Um, but <laughs> I, 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 the reason why is that right there is trying to get more representation into the industry from HBCUs to create this pipeline of, of people that just, it just doesn't exist right now. There's a lot of very successful people that have came from HBCUs and are doing well, but the infrastructure is not in place for these organizations to constantly go out and do recruiting there or professional organizations to solely dedicate to there. And I think we need to get that infrastructure up to the level of the PWIs of this world so that, you know, it's it's more of an equal playing field between these schools. So you're saying hey, so everything that you're saying hold on, is, is hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I just want to interject real quick and I'll get back to you, Scott, and then back to Josh. Um I, I, I like to always on this show make sure that everybody's on the same page when it comes to acronyms and I don't like to <laughs> assume anything. So, you know, very quickly for our listening audience, watching audience, HBCU 
historically black colleges and universities, just in case nobody knows what that is. Somebody doesn't yeah. know what that is. Also, for those that are listening only, when AJ says people that look like him, he's not just referring to your almost middle-aged, bald, <laughs> bearded guy in black t-shirt. He means he's African-American. Uh, yes. You probably picked up on that as well. And, and also, final comment, sort of a comment and sort of a question, and then I'll flip it back to Scott, though, is um, uh, maybe it's just a point I'm noticing. You, know, you, you talked about how to make compliance sound more cool instead of nerdy. And, and I'm like, wow, you know, like black people have issues with being cool or being considered nerds, too. I thought it was just the white people that were nerds. <laughs> Oh no! No, yeah, we no. We, def- we definitely do too. <laughs> oh yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> so wait, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to back up a step. I apologize. Well, um, Josh, I was going to let Scott go first. Oh, I'm sorry, you... Scott. Go ahead. Go ahead. I apologize. My apologies. <laughs> um, so, White man AJ, shakes uh, fist at thanks, Sky. For, thanks for joining thanks us. So. Um, you, you've talked. You, you've hit on a, a lot of really, really good points, right? But I think one that that you're missing, and I want to hear you speak about, is. The generations that we're dealing with now, along with some infosec people, right? And this is this is pretty much a broad problem. Uh, they want the instant gratification, right? They want to be able to sit back and say, "Well, I did X. I've you know I got Y in in, in result, and I'm gonna I'm gonna process out Z, right?" How do you instill dedication to the craft, right? It's not understanding compliance is not as simple as you know, uh, sitting down and saying, well, I'm going to read, I'm going to read a SOC 2 report, right? There's a yeah. lot more to it than just, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to check a box or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that this regulation hits this S3 bucket, right? Um, how do you instill dedication into the craft and really mold people to understand that it's not just a one and done thing? Like what, what is your plan for, for approaching uh, people that are not in compliance and teaching that dedication point, like maybe drawing on some of your army experience, how would you go about doing that? Yeah, it um, it's definitely something in in my generation where that instant gratification is just it's it's a curse because it it stops people from putting in the necessary work as you're as you're describing there, Scott. And I think for me, it's actually less of my army background, but more of my sports background where in sports, you have to be dedicated to the process. You can't worry about the result because if you think about the course of a season, you're, you're practicing way more than you're doing games. And you're practicing in those games, especially in college, you know, the regular season mattered, but it really didn't matter until we got to the ACC tournament. So you think about 18, 19 year olds are told in September, you're going to work every day, three, four hours a day for the ultimate goal that's not coming until March that mindset of falling in love with the work every day definitely helped me out in my career, especially in compliance. Because like you said, it's not just enough in compliance to know what the SOC 2 criteria is. It's not just enough to know, okay, I have to check security groups um, to make sure we address CC 6.6. It's you have to want to dive deeper, understand what is the criteria actually getting at, and then go look at the thing that I think with all compliance professionals is we live in an era now where you can't have technical auditors and non-technical auditors. Everything's Mm -hmm. technical. So if you're an auditor, you're technical. Whether you want to be or not, you you have to understand some basic levels of what the cloud is. You got to understand what the shared responsibility model is. Uh, And it's taking that next step and saying, I'm not going to just know the standard. I'm not going to just know the framework. I'm going to put the work in. And the work means it's going to take me two months to figure out what this means in the cloud. It may take me three months to figure out Kubernetes and addressing security there, but that's a part of the process. That's the part where I think if we can really mold these two fields of the the deep tech field um, where the engineers live and the compliance field where the furthest away from engineers live and we can get them closer together where uh, you have this constant curiosity of a mindset where you're constantly tweaking things, you're constantly trying to figure out better and different ways to do things. I think that's where the the really strong compliance professionals come into play. But for me, it's all about falling in love with the process. You have to be willing to ignore any results, um, really, especially in compliance, because every client's different. Um, no matter if you're doing 30 SOC 2s in the year 
all 30 are completely different because of the different technologies that are being used. So you have to just have that process, follow it and be willing to just continue to dive in. And you may not actually understand at the level that you want to for the audit for another year, because it takes a lot of batting practice. That's the thing about uh, compliance that I think is different. Somebody mentioned, I was on a, on a, a call or I don't, I don't know what it was, a happy hour or something last night. Uh, and they were like, I think, you know, most uh, vets should get right into entrepreneurship because they have all these skills. And I was like, well, I don't know. Um, if I tried to start this company that I just started before I learned about compliance and the ins and outs of SOC 2 and the details of ISO and HIPAA and how all these things relate, I would be dying right now. I'd be struggling because it's too complex for you to learn in a short time period. So anybody going into compliance should know Treat it mm-hmm. like a four-year degree. Treat it like anything else where it's a long process. And I think with anything that I've been able to achieve in life, it's because I am so comfortable with just putting in work every day. Um, I'm comfortable going to practice every day. I didn't play a right. lot at Florida State for anybody that Googled me. So I was used to riding the bench, which means <laughs> practices were my games. <laughs> and I loved the process. I loved practice. Right. I love to get out there and and go at my teammates because it's it's that the process part of it just became fun to me. So I think that's the that's the part, Scott. Uh, hey, hey, take, AJ, I think, I think dig well, Jeff, you. hold on, oh. Jeff, Jeff, hold on. I think on behalf of everybody, thank you for your service. Okay. Oh uh, yeah. My pleasure. I, I got, I got more out of the army than, than I gave it. So, um, it definitely was, was my pleasure. And I, and I just was able to follow in the footsteps of my father who he served in the Marines for 20 years. Uh, so he, he, he definitely made a, a larger sacrifice than my six months, but, um, I appreciate that. What I wanted to say was what I think I heard you say just now, AJ, is that uh, learning the technology side of things like Kubernetes, you can do in three months, but learning compliance, <laughs> it takes four years. Uh, and I, I'm waffling between thinking, wow, this guy's scary smart because I've been trying to learn Kubernetes, Kubernetes for like two <laughs> years now. Uh, and <laughs> and thinking, okay, maybe he didn't mean that. But yeah. So that's more of a statement uh, uh, or an observation. What I wanted to ask is, um, you know, since we're, we're, you know, in segment one, we're trying to frame the problem and and we've we've had a good discussion so far. What I'm curious about is, uh, given what I know about the diversity problem in general in our community and particularly on the security side, the labor shortage, uh, all the... I, you know, back when I used to go to conferences, I got approached by people all the time asking, how do I get into the industry? How do I break in? I, like you said, I want to be a pen tester. And of course, I always try to turn them off to, well, you know, there's more to it than pen testing. There's a whole lot of other things. And, and pen testing, although we 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 put it up on a pedestal in, in some ways and and uh, and at the risk of pissing people off i would say in a lot of ways pen testing is one of the least important uh uh and career, most destructive career fields and most destructive <laughs> in this industry um what are if based on your observation and experience what would you say are some of the uh, differences in terms of the experience of African Americans uh, 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 getting into the industry, uh, you know, career choices, skill choices. Like s- somebody asked uh, on the on the Discord server a while back when you were talking about the you know getting into the universities, and you were talking you know the difference between PWI and HCBU. They were they were simply asking why the focus on education when getting a degree, at least collectively in this field, seems to be less of a uh, of a, an important thing these days. You know, with certifications and experience being the other things that can do um I, I, you know i can't speak for the black man you can't speak for the white man but certainly based on your observations from from where you're sitting what are some of the differences uh, in terms of uh, you know how do black people get into this how do black people approach yep. getting the right you understand what i'm asking yep no yeah and i i agree with that person in the chat about universities i i think colleges are are have a reckoning coming, especially after this year with everything going virtual, they're not going to be able to charge ridiculous amount of fees anymore. Um, and I, and I think for cybersecurity, you don't need a degree. Uh, there's really no reason, but that's where a lot of 18 and 22 year olds <laughs> that are, uh, especially, uh, us black folk, uh, most of us come out of college with a ridiculous amount of debt. 
Uh, so the reason why I'm focusing on going there is to help them get some gainful employment and, and get closer to being financially free uh, after uh, forking out all that, that, that money for student loans. Um, but I think the challenges are, uh, Jeff, about access. Uh, it's about being able to not have to deal with what we all know goes on with job descriptions in this industry, where you're asking for someone with the CISSP with one year of experience and uh, 10 years of Kubernetes experience, um, and you want to pay them 40K. Uh, those job descriptions are not going to allow us to solve this skills gap. Um, and, and, and Black people uh, that are trying to get in this field, oftentimes that's the only way they think they can get in uh, is through applying blindly or going on uh, Indeed or LinkedIn and, and applying. And I think that's the, the a part of this, this transformation that we have to go through where every person, um, I think, needs to begin to focus on building their personal brand um, at a very early age. Um, begin yep. to tell people who you are, what you care about, and what you know on a regular basis. Uh, whether and, and LinkedIn is a great place to do that. You, you know, writing your own blog is a great place to do that. But people have to do... Uh, especially black people, I think this is something that I've always felt, and I'm, uh, I'll be interested to hear your take, Flea, uh, that I had to do a little bit more. Uh, the whole reason I got my master's from Georgetown University was because I thought I needed to do a little bit more to reach a certain level, a, a height being a, a, a black guy with a non-traditional tech background in cybersecurity. So I was like, let me go and check this block. So there's one less thing they can hold up against me um, when it comes to this. And, and we always feel like this zero sum game where if we don't have everything checked off, we're not going to make it, um, wait, which wait. is where these ridiculous job descriptions come into play. But I think that's where the personal brand starts to help and people need to uh, begin to build up who they are uh, and show who they are to potential employers um, and and to, to be able to stand out. But for the one thing I do want to talk about that you you mentioned there, Jeff, the, the skills gap or the uh, job shortage, whatever we're calling it nowadays, I think the prob the reason why there there's one that exists is if you just look at the diversity numbers in the field, uh, you can't fill three million unfilled jobs by only hiring white people. <laughs> it's just not going to work. You're, you're, you're well, going to fall short. General, we're going to always have job say, shortages. So I, I you think got to hire. I think in general, Sorry. we can say that recruiting is broken across the board. And yep. M uh, in Discord pointed that out, and we completely agree. Yep. Yep. Actually, AJ, yep. can I can I yep. break yep. in here for just a second? I want to sort of talk about what you're talking, you know, <clears throat> what you're saying. And I think that a lot of the points you're making are fantastic. You're talking about the personal brand. I, I, when I, I, I had a talk with a, a student this morning that got referred by one of my friends who said, hey, can you talk to him? He's, he's fantastic. He had an internship. You know, he's in a senior year at, at a college uh, with, a, with an MIS degree and, and, a, and a, a secure InfoSec degree, excuse me. He was doing stuff at CCDC. He got an internship at, a, at an intelligence agency, and he was halfway through his security clearance. And then because of COVID, they stopped and said, sorry, no internships this year. And he's flailing because he doesn't know what to do because he had his yeah. role lined up, if you know what I mean. And I, I sat down with the kid for half an hour. He's a great kid. And I, I walked him through a lot of different things he can do. And eventually he's like, well, how many places should I put a resume in? I went, none. He said, what, what do you exactly. mean? I'm like, don't just throw resumes at places because they get a pile about this thick in 20 minutes and 99.9% .9 of them get thrown into the automatic HR word filter and shredder. Okay. Yeah. If you miss the, the, the HR word filter, you, mm -hmm. they don't, no, not a human even takes a look at it. So don't yep. bother. I said, figure out where you want to go first and then let's figure out how to get you in there. Well, how do you do that? I'm like, okay, so you studied pen testing for how long? And he goes, because he wants to be a pen tester. Oh, dear God. And he's like, well, I, I studied it for years. I'm like, and you don't think of using that in your life? And it, it yeah. just weirded him out. And a good friend of mine, Dr. Dr. Mouse, Sandy Clark, gave a, a, a talk years ago, God, 10 years ago now, where she was like, how to hack your way into a PhD and, and how to hack your way into the business. And she actually found out, she's like, okay, I want to go to this college. I want to take my PhD program under this person. So she, uh, I believe it was Matt Blaze. So she went to a conference where Matt was and sat next to him and asked a question or he was talking and asked a question, I forget, and then struck up a conversation. And eventually he said, so where are you taking a PhD? She went, I'm not. He said, what do you mean you're not? She goes, well, I'm not taking a PhD. He goes, you are now and grabbed her and brought her into his PhD program. Yeah. And like 
these are the things you do. And I'm not saying you stalk people or hack things or whatever. I'm saying utilize the techniques that we understand about relationships and about people and about security to get your way into a program, to do what you need to do to get into the job. You want a job at doing X? Find all the companies doing X, pick the top <laughs> 10 that you want to do it for, and yeah. find a way to get to somebody at that company or one of those companies, one of those top 10 companies, and say, hey, how do I get into your company? Yeah. You know? And, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to like sort of steal your, your thunder there, but it was, yeah. it bothers me that people are so friggin' smart mm -hmm. and they don't think of using these skills in their, in their actual regular life. Because they're not trying taught to steal to. someone's Wi Fi. Yeah. It's, it's, it's because yeah. they're not taught to. They're not taught to. What we're dealing with are the antiquated methods that have worked for generations and generations of trying to get a job. People are not thinking yep. outside of the box. They're not applying themselves and they're not taking the skills that they have and saying, hey, at you know a conference or wherever, hey, I can do X for you. You know, what do you think? You know, uh, and, and what a lot of people don't understand is that. They, they, they feel that trying to get a job is a well-regimented process, right? And for, yeah. for a lot of companies, it is. But what's driving that process? Compliance. Hey, let's, right? uh, hey, let's hey, take I, a pause I wanted, I wanted for to a minute. circle back around to something that AJ said uh, with regards to needing the additional like, kind of like certifications and things like that, you know, him pursuing his own master's degree. And I'm actually kind of curious in particular when we think about underrepresented minority groups, it is a trait that we actually just see a lot of, like kind of like this idea that I have to check every single box, I need to have all these certifications, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, somewhat actually leaning into, you know, like the classic imposter syndrome. AJ, I I'm kind of curious, was your master's degree actually useful to you uh, with regards to actually pursuing, you know, your career in compliance or was it what you just, perceived as a, a necessary certification. Um, and, and do you think that had you been a different demographic, like you, you've been the classic, I guess, white guy, do you feel like you would have thought that it was necessary or have you ever been challenged because of, you know, literally, you know, the, the, the color of your skin and your certifications? Yeah, AJ, I, uh, before you I answer, AJ, AJ, before you answer, we need to take a quick break. I promise when we come back, <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you respond. I mean, we'll just keep going, but we need to take a break because our sponsors want to get their airplay. So yes. hold, hold that thought. We'll be right back.